So welcome everyone on behalf of the Zen Education Project for our session on women in the Black Panther Party. Uh, uh, it's so good to join in community with you all every Friday for these sessions and it's a real honor to get to help facilitate today's session and to be in community with uh, these great scholars that we're going to hear from in a moment. Some of you are joining us for the first time and some of you have participated in, in one or each of the sessions over the past five weeks. Folks should know we have two ASL interpreters. If you want ASL interpretation, please pin Rodney LeBon and Crystal Butler alternately as they are signing. So I'm Jesse Hagopian. I am a high school teacher and editor with Rethinking Schools uh, quarterly magazine and we coordinate the Zen Education Project along with Teaching for Change. The Zen Education Project is hosting this session today and offers uh, free downloadable people's history lessons. I think a lot of you have probably accessed those already um, for middle and high school classrooms. If you haven't, I highly recommend you go to the website and find a lesson that matches what you're teaching. It's an invaluable resource in my own classroom. And we have lessons at the Zen Education Project site on the Black Panther Party. I actually co-wrote one of them with Adam Sanchez. It's a role play and folks can uh, invite their students to transform themselves into different members of the Black Panther Party and also some of their greatest foes and uh, invite the students to meet each other and find out what they learn. So I hope folks will check that lesson out. Before Robin, Spencer, and Mary Phillips launch their conversation, we want to find out who is in the room and go through our plans for our time together. We are going to do a quick poll to find out how many teachers, librarians, teacher educators, um, educators of all kinds, historians, parents, students, and others are in the room with us. We'd love to know who you all are. Um, but yes, Mary Phillips focuses on women and gender in post-1945 social movements, black feminisms, and the carceral state. Okay. So welcome. Thanks for being with us here today. You guys can unmute and, and um, take the mic, please. Yeah. I think we'll mute all and then they can unmute. Let's okay. see, mute all, okay. And then they should unmute now. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you so much for having us. Um, I want to begin our conversation by talking about when women joined the Black Panther Party and why they joined. Um, there were many Black Panther groups inspired by the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. Many people are probably familiar with that organization and their symbol of the Black Panther. In 1966 in Oakland, California, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale founded the Black Panther Party. Women joined a year later in the spring of 1967. The first woman to join the Black Panther Party was actually a young teenage girl named Tarika Lewis. She was a student activist in her high school. She was very adamant in um, advocating for a Black history club at her high school. Um, and she, when she came to the Black Panther Party headquarters, she actually demanded to join the organization and pointed out the lack of women um, that was part of the organization at that time. And so her presence opened the door for others to join. Just like the men, the women wanted to serve their communities in very practical ways to address issues like police brutality. They wanted to respond to conditions of civil rights. They were also part of local civil rights struggles. Some were attracted to the political ideology and for others joining the organization was a natural outgrowth of longstanding activism in their families. Well, I wanna bring in the voice of one Panther woman um, that I had the chance to interview, Ellen Dar Barnes. Um, she was a Panther woman who lived in Oakland. She grew up there and she subsequently relocated to New York. So she's resided in New York currently. Uh, Ellen Dar Barnes talked about her attraction to the Black Panther Party as an extension of the politics of self-defense. And her story really allows us to connect the long history 
of the Black freedom struggle. Um, so she talks about the deacons for defense in the South. So I'm gonna quote from her directly. So these are her, her words. I became very involved in that level of politics because it was an extension of what I knew, an extension of what they call the deacons for defense down South. My grandfather was the first person to buy land on what was considered the white part of town. I go visit him in the summers and I remember that the Ku Klux Klan burnt a cross on his yard because they opposed him living on that side of town. I remember asking him, Papa, why you always got a gun? He'd reply, it's for the white folks, baby. Papa, why you get up so early? To keep up with the white folks, baby. That's from very young. That's why I joined the Panthers. I came from that idea of standing up. And I think a lot of people in Oakland have these Southern roots and that whole connection with that idea of protecting your own. People were used to keeping and using guns because that's what they did in the country. My grandfather always kept a gun. It was invisible, but it was always in the back of the car or up in the window in the back of the truck. And they said in the South that they were for hunting, but he said it was for the white man. And it wasn't for the white man who wasn't bothering you. It was for the KKK and the others. And that's what moved me into the Panthers. So Ellen Dar Barnes on why she became a Panther. This in particular, based their organization on a 10 point program and platform. Some of you may be familiar with that. Some of the points in the program and platform was um, the right to full employment, decent housing, quality education, an immediate end to police brutality, a right to a jury of your peers, freedom from racial inequities, poverty, structural barriers, much of the same um, issues that they were um, really advocating for during this period, we're still fighting for right now. They were influenced by revolutionary thinkers such as Malcolm X, Queen Mother Moore, France Fanon, and others. And as the Panthers spread nationwide and internationally during this time, you had the Vietnam War going on, you had African liberation struggles, hundreds of women joined the organization. They saw themselves part of a global movement and they contributed to one of the most powerful attempts to create a more just world. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. I hope that people in the audience have seen images of the Panther women. Um, those images are so powerful. I hope that you've had a chance to really just see, see those images um, in, of Panther women in photographs or in artistic representation. Because the arts was one of the ways that the Panthers really delivered their political message. Um, their newspaper, the Black Panther, created in 1967, grew to be one of the most popular alternative newspapers. Um, it really delivered their message around the country and around the world. And they used the pages of their newspaper as a canvas. It's important to note that the women served as graphic artists creating these images. So I wanna talk a little bit about the women who created some of the images and then look at some of the images and the women who were in the images and how black women played such a pivotal role in sort of carrying the Panthers message. So Tarika Lewis was not just the first woman to join the Black Panther Party, she was also an artist. Her drawings used sharp and rounded angles to depict black men and women with intense beauty. She signed her pieces Matalaba. Gail Dixon was also another Panther artist. She created artwork in the Panthers under the name Asali. Her style carried a sense of realism where women's authenticity was celebrated, um, especially in urban contexts and they were shown in their everyday environment. Emery Douglas served as the Panthers Minister of Culture, creating world famous images of struggle. And I know you've seen those. Right? Women were at the center of many of his pieces. Let's travel back to the Panthers era and look at two of his pieces with center black women. All right, so at this time, I want to have um, everybody take a look at the first, this first image. And I want you to um, draft what 
what meaning does this draw for you? And I am going to just read a couple of comments in the chat box. So I'm gonna have you take some time if you could just go ahead and write some comments in the chat box of, of the first things that speak to you. Uh, just read a couple of them. Self-sacrifice, collective struggle, the personal is political. Warrior, reclamation of control by Black women. And so I want to, with that in mind, I want to point out that, I want to point out some of the photos on the wall. And so you see a photo of Erica Huggins, Bobby Seale, Huey P. Newton at the time. Um, these were political prisoners who were really uh, in the midst of a trial for a crime they did not commit. And so in a way there is a, uh, a tribute to the political prisoners at the time, um, as well as you can see uh, the image really talking about poverty and the way in which um, she is really combating um, uh, poverty at the center with the rats. So this is uh, something that we're focused on and we're going to address. Um, The bottom of the image, I don't know if that's visible, but I just want to highlight that the very bottom of the image has language from the Panthers 10 point platform and program, which says we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. It's important to note that the woman is at the center of the image fighting back against rats, against poverty, against oppression, the presence of rats in rundown housing has been well documented and is a continuing reality. It is these conditions and the reality of repression that prompted the Panthers to expand their community survival programs in the 1970s. And if we could just show the second image So the second image reflects the growth of the community survivor programs. And the picture, Emory Douglas Center's community programs, such as the free clothing program, the free shoe program, the free food program, the buses to prison program, the uh, free health clinics, and the people's liberation schools. Commitment to the party's community program is represented by a black woman armed with clothes, shoes, a hat, the Panther newspaper, her purse, earrings, and a gun in tow. It really represents um, the continuities and changes in the Panthers political program in the body of a black woman. Emory Douglas is reminding audiences that revolution was not just one thing. Then as the black freedom movement evolved in the 1970s, and the terrain of struggle shifted, that the ideal of the Panthers would focus on their survival program. And this ideal of survival pending revolution was a shift in the Panther strategy, but also represented these continuities and that the black woman was centered as the vehicle for communicating this particular message. And this particular image and the one before, teacher, this can do a lot of work in the classroom. Yes, yes. So I want to shift to thinking about the impact of Panther membership, of the way in which Panther membership had on um, 
these young women and the impact that they had on the world of the Panthers. Women often joined the Black Panther Party at high school or they were in college. Many Panther women balance motherhood with the daily responsibilities of community organizing. And we're going to show a brief video of Stanley Nelson's documentary, Vanguard of the Revolution. In this video, you see Phyllis Jackson really talking about the way in which women balance motherhood with the daily responsibilities of community organizing. Phyllis Jackson played a major role in the Panthers' success of mobilizing thousands of votes during the electoral campaigns of Elaine Brown and Bobby Seale. Mm -hmm. I was in labor cooking breakfast for the breakfast program. So I was between contractions flipping pancakes. <laughs> I would spend all the day answering the phones, even after I had my son when I came back to work. I used to have to jump him up and down really heavy because it just wouldn't stop crying as I'm answering the phone. You name it, I clean freezers with a toothpick. And that's how I'd answer the phone. Black Panther Party National Headquarters, Black Panther Party Central Headquarters, can I help you? Dear Huey, when I joined the party, I was thrilled about becoming part of an organization that believes in the equality of men and women. It bothers me that there are brothers who still view women as sexual objects. We should have no men in the Black Panther Party who feel this way, or women for that matter. One of the ironies of the Black Panther Party is that the image is the black male with the jacket and the gun but the reality is the majority of the rank and file at, at, by the end of the 60s are women. Everybody knows that all the people don't have liberty, all the people don't have freedom, all the people don't have justice, and all the people don't have power, so that means none of us do. The Black Panther Party certainly had a chauvinist tone, and so we tried to change some of the clear gender roles so that women had guns, and men cook breakfast for children. Did we overcome it? Of course we didn't. As I like to say, we didn't get these brothers from revolutionary heaven. That clip, I think, um, is so powerful just to see all of those Panther women. And I think that that is the message that we really want to convey is that there are so many stories, um, so many names, so many locations where Panther women um, made their impact, so many experiences, right? Um, the Black Panthers' radical political ideas, um, their anti-imperialist ideas, their anti-capitalist ideas, meant that they faced the brunt of the vicious campaign of anti-Black red baiting launched by the FBI. So Panther women like Afeni Shakur and Asada Shakur faced arrest, uh, being jailed, and were made into potent symbols as political prisoners. So it's important to think about the sacrifices made by Panther women as well. History remembers the high profile names. The names that I recounted might be names that you have heard before, right? But I hope that during the course of our presentation that we've given you names you've heard before, but also names that maybe you haven't heard before. And I know that there are probably Panther women listening and in the audience, you know, today who can tell their own stories um, as well. So we have other stories to tell. So for example, Frances Carter, who was incarcerated in New Haven, Connecticut with Erica Huggins, recounted the maltreatment of Panther women incarcerated with her. And I just want to give a quote, and this is from um, some of my work. <clears throat> we are isolated in Niantic State Prison for women. When we go to court, we are escorted by two state troopers in front and two state troopers in back. Our mail is censored. It takes sometimes 15 days for it to get from one place to another. 
and this demonstrates the high surveillance and the punitive measures such as isolation that women experienced, um, you know, who were identified as political prisoners because of their identity as a Black Panther Party member. Yes. Well, from the, yeah. Well, from the first women that supported the founding of the Black Panther Party, um, from community other mother, Ruth Beckford, um, who was the elder in the community, who supported the Panthers, who carried their message, who um, very famously made the curtains for the first office in Oakland, California, to the first handful of women that opened the doors, to people like Kathleen Cleaver, communications secretary, the first woman on the Central Committee, to women like Barbara Cox and Charlotte O'Neill, who traveled to Algeria as part of the Panther International Section, to women like Audrea Jones, who helmed the Panthers' health activism in Boston, to Erica Huggins, the last director of the Panthers' Oakland Community Schools. Um, women really transformed the Black Panther Party in unforgettable ways. We're eager to give you a chance to talk about some of this content. Um, so we want to hand it off to Jesse to give you that opportunity. Excellent. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation and reminding us all the central role women played in this amazing revolutionary organization. Um, yeah, it was just really moving and, and the graphics and the, uh, everything really brought it to life. So uh, what an honor to get to learn from you all today. We're going to pause now so that you can meet some fellow participants and process what you've been hearing. And don't drop, drop off just yet for two reasons. One, you'll get to meet some great people in the breakout session. And two, you'll get to hear more from our speakers when we return. In fact, they'll be answering some of the questions that come out of these discussions, okay? So we will automatically place you in breakout groups of five to six in just a moment. And if at any time you wanna leave and return to the main room, you can do that. And once in a small group, you can go around and introduce yourself and say where you are from. In some groups, there will be a Zen Education Project teacher volunteer who will introduce themselves and facilitate. But given the size of this group, we don't, if we don't have a facilitator for every breakout room, then um, if there's not one in yours, we just ask that one of the teachers in the group or someone uh, with facilitation experience volunteer um you only have about 12 minutes so please uh quickly introduce yourself with your name where you're from and your role go around the room and and do that and then have an open discussion you can talk about what did you know about the panthers before today's session um how has your how has focusing on women in the black panther party really changed or deepened your understanding of the organization? Why is it important to include the Panthers and women in the party in K-12 curriculum? And when you teach about the Black Freedom Movement, why is this history so, so vital? And then you could talk about specifically uh, for educators in the room, um, any curricular light bulbs that, that went off, okay? Anything you're feeling inspired to investigate further or, or to teach in your classroom and uh, we would love to hear what comes of your discussion. So we'll give you a three minute and then a 30 second alert when it's time to return to the full group and you will be returned just automatically. And before we go into the groups, um, just an equity consideration, make sure everybody has spoken before you speak again. We wanna give everyone a chance uh, to talk. All right, so thank you so much and we'll see you in the breakout rooms and see you back here soon. A lot of good questions and, and conversations about how to apply this in our classrooms arose from that brilliant discussion about women in the Black Panther Party. Um, 
you know, in our session, people wanting to really seek out and research Tarika Lewis, which I had the, the great honor of meeting a couple of years ago uh, here in Seattle. So I'm looking forward to all the questions that are gonna come up and I wanna just turn it back over to our presenters. All right. So if there's any questions, I'm trying to keep up with the chat box. Um, we wanna get your questions in. <laughs> Maybe as we sort of take in some of the questions, we can start out by just talking a little bit about the Panthers and education. Yeah. Uh, since we do have so many educators and just thinking about the Panther school. So um, Mary is doing some amazing work on the Panthers uh, school and Erica Huggins who did many amazing things as a member of the Black Panther Party, including helming the school for many years. So Mary, I don't know if you wanna start off the conversation and then you know we can just bounce back and forth. Yeah, so I don't know how many people are familiar with the fact that the Black Panther Party did have their own school, the Oakland Community School. It was the last community survival um, program. Um, it was an elementary level institution. It became, you know, like I said, the Panthers longest running community survival program. It initially started as the Intercommunal Youth Institute. Um, in 1971, a homeschool safe haven for children um, of the Panthers due to the FBI's, you know, COINTELPRO program harassment that um, many um, what I call Panther Cubs uh, were um, experiencing. But by 73, 74, the Intercommunal Youth Institute evolved into the Oakland Community School with an enrollment of 50 children. And I think what's so beautiful about the Oakland Community School is the way that they taught their pedagogy. So students came from a variety of social and economic backgrounds. Most were from um, poor working class backgrounds. Um, you know, in existence for almost 10 years, the administration utilized culturally relevant pedagogy, which I think, which I think is really critical, and which students can see themselves um, in um, the material, in their history, the culture was reflected in the classroom experience. Um, and what I love about the Oakland Community School is how they embrace this idea of whole body education. So that's when they take into account the mental, the physical, the emotional, the abstract, the creative intelligence. So they really try to fulfill all of these needs, all of the different aspects of the young child. Um, they also integrated um, restorative justice. Um, they had a justice board, um, which was ran by a small youth committee. And these young children will would address any kind of harm or concerns on their own and come up with a mutual agree agreement um, so they learn account you know how to take accountability community building um, initiatives how to work through their differences which is critical um, and they would do this with no adults in a room and so they was given the skills to do this um, and they were committed um, you know, when we talk about restorative justice, it, it works in a way where no one is shunned, no one is stigmatized, um, as opposed to our criminal um, justice system where that happens. And so students learn valuable life skills. Um, they listened attentively, they problem solved. Another thing is they practice yoga as a form of discipline at the school. So they was really cutting edge, cutting edge and um, um, very forward thinking in the kinds of strategies of learning that they implemented in the school. That's just a little taste of the Panther School. It was so popular. They had parents with unborn babies, you know, registering uh, for, the, for the school. Um, they won tons of awards and it, it was to be a model institution in Oakland. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I encourage everyone to learn about the Oakland Community School. There's a lot of great resources um, that are out there about the school. There's even a wonderful um, short video that's available on um, YouTube and there are wonderful um, documentaries in production, right? So you can learn more about those. We'll uh, be sending around some information about content 
um, after, after the fact. I wanted to address some of the questions maybe in whole that I see happening in the chat boxes. There are a couple of questions that seem to be centered around the question of resistance, not the Panthers as a resistance movement, um, which they were, but resistance to centering the Panthers in the curriculum and then women in the Panthers in general, right? Thinking about how oftentimes this history of radical resistance is oftentimes resisted and marginalized and how oftentimes there's kind of a Malcolm versus Martin model out there and that prevails in classrooms and sometimes marginalizes people who um, adopt radical stances against um, violent repression um, in this time period. So how to get around that, right? This is a very real um, barrier um, that's there in terms of centering the Panthers in the curriculum. But one thing I think that is very clear uh, when you look at the story of the Black Panther Party is that there's something very central to how they connect to all elements of US history in this time period, right? Their story is a very American story, right? The story of housing and displacement, the story of migration post-World War II, the story of um, political organization, the story of radicalization, um, the ways in which they mobilize their connection to uh, the great society programs and the reform movements of the 1960s, their connections to a global revolutionary movement in the 1960s, their connection to the growing Vietnam War, right? These are ways you can centrally connect the Panthers to all of the other elements um, that are going on in this time period, whether it be the counterculture, whether it be the US war um, in Vietnam, whether it be the women's movement, whether it be the mainstream civil rights movement. To think about the Panthers as connected to those movements is very central. We started out by telling you that the Panthers were one of many Black Panther parties influenced by the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which was a, um, you know, a program that came out of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, right? That is the place to start with thinking about the Panthers. And also to unpack this question of the violent 1960s. Where was the violence in the 1960s? Was it from these groups that were practicing armed self-defense or was it from the massive resistance to uh, the Black freedom movement? Um, Right now, I know in our audience, we have SNCC veterans, we have Panther veterans. I know we have Judy Richardson, who's put together a great documentary on the Orangeburg uh, massacre. Right now, we're walking into the wake of the Jackson State um, shootings. There's so many ways that we can think about recentering um, the types of violence that activists face in the 1960s as they fought for their rights. And I think about ways in which we connect the Panthers to that legacy. And instead of positioning them as so outside of the pale, but thinking about them as within that same tradition, right? And when we think about women in the Panthers, we have to think about women like Gloria Richardson, women who were part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, women who um, stood up in all of these movements of the 1960s who were influenced by um, the radical women who were coming out of the Vietnamese struggle, who were coming out of the Algerian struggle, who were part of a global upsurge of a new way of thinking about uh, women's radicalism at the time. So what was happening with the Panthers was not something that was unique and um, unprecedented, right? It was part of larger political and historical cross currents. And in this way, we can say that if we learn about the Panthers, we're learning about US history, we're learning about global history, we're learning about all of those standards, right, that, that people like to put together that oftentimes decenter um, black and brown people. But in a lot of ways, if we sort of reconceptualize them, it's important to think about that. And we have to move beyond the Malcolm versus Malcolm, mm -hmm. Malcolm versus Martin um, dichotomy even though I know that that is so much of how um, the Black Freedom Movement is taught. But luckily we have entities like the Zen Education Project, Teaching for Change, and wonderful curriculum um, that's produced by scholars like, um, and teachers and archivists 
that allow us to think about how just one primary source can shift the conversation. Mm -hmm. Just by showing the students that image, one image can change a conversation, right? It can add some nuance to a story that they may think that they already know, right? So it's about thinking about how you can use these primary sources, these images, these oral histories to tell another type of story. And I want to add that um, it's a couple of people that have been asking a question about gender and sexuality in the Black Panther Party. And I just want to answer that question um, a little bit when we talk about um, non gender nonconforming um, or um, folks that I may have identified as, you know, gay or LGBT or what have you. And one thing I want to point out is that the Black Panther Party worked through all of their differences. For some people, sexuality was fluid um, in the organization. And um, part of, so everybody brought, Erica Huggins always talks about how everybody brought their stuff to the, the organization, right? Um, and we work through those differences, but it's important to point out that the Panthers did make an effort to coalition with women's liberation groups, feminist organizations, LGBT identified organizations, um, you know, Huey P. Newton, wrote an open letter in support of the gay liberation and feminist movements. And that's one of the most, I argue, in his, in his writings, powerful documents, because he not only calls out the homophobia that was existing um, at the time among some members in the Black Panther Party, but he says, look, we can't do this work alone. We need to mobilize. He says, look, folks that identify as LGBT are one of the most radical folks out there and we need to mobilize with them and coalition with them and we need to work through our own stuff and his language in a letter i'm not sure how many people have read the open letter it's very raw <laughs> and unapologetic and so you know there was there's there was many coalitions um, that the Panthers did. And even if you look in the Panther newspaper, you know, you will see interviews with um, leading members in the um, Black feminist uh, groups at the time, with them taking on issues that deals with sexism, that deals with gender politics. You see women really placing um, these concerns at the center and talking about these issues. Um, particularly if you look in the 70s, you know, you, you'll see this. So I want to, I want to make sure that I address that um, as well. Definitely. And, and I see some questions about COINTELPRO and the silencing of COINTELPRO in the larger history of Black radicalism, the history of women, um, and the history of this period in particular. So I definitely want to sort of highlight that and, and say that, yes, we do have to tell those stories, this history of political repression uh, in, the, in the 1960s and before as well, to make sort of a long history of political repression and the long, it's sort of to connect that to the histories of the political radicals and the history of the carceral state, the role of the police and their history in these United States and what has that meant for Black dissidents. And I think thinking about the ways in which people like Dr. King were set upon by the FBI helps to frame how we think about the Panthers and COINTELPRO because they're oftentimes seen as, well, they kind of deserve that, right? Because they were out here with their radical ideas, right? When you think about, when you start with nonviolent activists being surveilled, harassed, um, and uh, positioned into almost suicides, right? Um, you think about some of the more recent primary sources that have come out, um, you know, around manipulation of people like Dr. King and others, right? And then also to go beyond that, right? What did it mean to not be a person whose name we might say and everyone recognizes, but to be going through that level of repression? What did it mean to be um, a rank and file member, a woman in the Black Panther Party, and be dealing with the daily surveillance. Um, how did that impact your life, your activism, et cetera, et cetera? These are the questions that we need to ask. And these are the ways that we need to think about accountability and telling this history and learning this story, 
right? Because it wasn't, we know the stories, the flashpoints, right? The moments where male leaders were arrested and it made headlines or people were assassinated in brutal ways and it, it left the scar on history that maybe no one can ignore, even though they try. But we don't know sometimes the daily grinding down, the ways in which that um, COINTELPRO and surveillance and repression really eroded the foundations of these movements in ways that um, push them into or try to push them into oblivion, right? So telling that part of the story is also central, right? So, and women, women in repression, women in motherhood, women in ideology, women in art, women in poetry, right? Women and um, education philosophy, women and nutrition, ideals about nutrition and parenting, right? All of these were discussed and central in the history of the Black Panther Party. All of these were radical ideas, but we don't tend to think about that. We think about the pa pa Black Panther Party, we have one narrow frame, right? What about if we broaden that? Then we'd really have a sense of what revolution looked like, the revolution that they were interested in making anyway. And I want to add the way in which when we talk about um, repression and we talk about um, women in particular, I mean, uh, much of my work looks at the way in which women were targeted during their incarceration and how they were framed, how they were plotted, how they were isolated, how they were beaten in prison, um, the lack of humanity and the resistance you know, what I have found in much of my research, and you can see this with Huey P. Newton, there was a particular, there was measures that these party members put in place um, that helped them survive so that they were able to come out of prison with their humanity intact, with their mind intact, um, uh, you know, and modes of resistance and the kind of community building and initiatives that they did in prison right, in a, in a system that's designed to really kill you, essentially, your mind and spirit, um, I think is, is useful um, for us to, um, to really um, take hold of. Um, so, absolutely. I mean, there's stories about um, political prisoners giving birth in prison and the kind of horrific treatment, giving birth under, you know, this kind of duress. So, all of these other stories um, oftentimes doesn't make it to that um, master narrative that we hear so often in the public. That's right. I just want to remind people before you leave, we have a, an evaluation that's going to come in about 10 minutes, but we have about 10 minutes still for questions and discussion. So if you're leaving, please fill out that before you go. Mm -hmm. I, I see some questions about change. Um, in terms of how the Panthers and Panther women have been portrayed. And I'm happy to report an uptick in some amazing literature that's been produced. Our young scholars are on it in terms of the articles that are being written, the books that are coming out, really, you know, bringing so much complexity to the question of gender, sexuality, um, disability politics, all different ways of thinking about the Black Power Movement and the Black Panther Party and gender and sexuality. And there's really so much more than there ever was before, right? And I think it's so important to connect what's happening at um, and coming out from professional historians to what's available to be used in the classrooms, right, by teachers. Right, and I think that's where the, the, the groups like the Zen Education Project, they, they're that bridge, right? There's the, they're the bridge that sort of create moments that can become curricular moments where analyses and like things like SEP, uh, NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities, summer institutes can be places where teachers can go and find out about new interpretations or ways to rethink things or to push back gently, right? or to reframe things or to um, just pivot, right? Sometimes it just takes that pivot, that seed to plant. I can't tell you how many seeds teachers have planted that have come and sprung up even years later when I didn't even realize it at the time. You know, just a question or, a, you know, someone that sort of made me think twice about something I thought I was sure about, I thought I knew, or I thought was a truism 
And then later on, I realized, oh, okay, there's another way of thinking about this. That's what teachers can do, right? For every child whose mind, you know, is, you know, available to them to, to touch, um, whether it be through these screens that we're forced into now or in person, but that's the power of being an educator. So I'm excited to see so many people out here and I'm excited at, the, at these connections. And I think there's more, more content than ever and literature. And when I did lots of questions about literature out there, people are reading books, fiction, our fiction writers are on it, telling these stories, our poets. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Student, kids can read, read these stories in their, you know, in their young adult literature. And um, that makes it more even accessible than what's coming from their teachers sometimes. It's coming from a book that they're enjoying and they're being entertained by and they're laughing with and they're seeing themselves in. It's even better. trying to read the questions here. Um, about health care came up? Anything about the Panthers and health? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm teaching a course on the Black Panther Party. And we, for those who don't know, you might, you should check out Alondra Nelson's uh, book um, that looks at the health clinics. It's such an important book. Um, and, you know, the Panthers have free health care clinics. They, the Panthers address sickle cell anemia. You know, they wrote all about this in, their, in the Panther newspaper as well. And I want to mention that a lot of the newspapers are online. And so you can access um, those um, newspapers as well. But you can come and get free testing for sickle cell anemia. They were doing research on sickle cell anemia um, at the time. Um, their health clinics, they were trying to demystify um, the medical system. You know, they really wanted to be uh, much more thorough and personable with the uh, when, when you come to the clinic, right? And so you can understand what the person was saying and they have volunteers coming in and, you know, they didn't always wear the coats or what have you because they wanted you to be able to, I mean, they were very strategic um, and organized with their health care um, clinics. They believed in it being free, accessible, um, and, uh, you know, they believed in de demystifying and really, um, you know, challenging um, the, the, the medical uh, system in a way in which there's a history of medical discrimination on black and brown bodies. And so they were very aware of that. Um, and they was having this discourse um, in the newspaper about various issues that affects, um, you know, our bodies and what have you. And so it was important and we in COVID-9 now, so I have my students draw the connections, you know, what do you imagine, how, how do you imagine the Black Panther Party would respond to COVID-9 based on the, the thorough and detailed work the Panthers were doing um, when we think about the free healthcare clinics. Um, and I have them look at all those archival documents um, that's available um, that you can access, where you can actually see what their day-to-day -day lives look like, um, the records, the memos, you know, um, of the health. Audrea Jones in Boston, she was running the healthcare clinic in Boston. You know, women's hands were on all these documents, um, were on all the community survival programs, and so. Um, we only know about a couple, but that's part of the work that we're trying to do, bring the more and more voices of women in the Black Panther Party to the center of the narrative. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. There was just a question also about other resources, mm -hmm. books and resources that people can use to further their education. So there is, I, I wouldn't have just mentioned, uh, mentioned, the Black Panther Party has an alumni website. It's called It's About Time, and I'll make sure that we put it in the resource guide that will be available. But there are tons of resources by alumni of the Black Panther Party as far as newspapers, you know, international and global alliances, a whole section on women. I mean, it is a massive amount of information on there that I think would be really helpful um, audio clips, video clips, um, all kinds of primary documents. So I'll make sure that, that folks get that link. And I, and I want to highlight that, you know, the, there's so many Panther women who are 
available, like people like Charlotte Hill O'Neill, she, she lives in Tanzania now, but she comes to the United States every year and she speaks to classroom groups, high schools, community centers, and other spaces where she'll talk about the ways that she's tried to bring the Panthers model of survival programs and community programs that she was involved in. And she's brought that to where she lives currently in Tanzania. So the ways that they are um, bringing that model of community education, of um, grassroots empowerment, of um, running a children's home, um, serving the community, body and soul, and bringing that model to another context and what that longevity has meant. Tarika Lewis is still out here. She's an amazing musician. Um, she gives talks, Erica Huggins, uh, Kathleen Cleaver, uh, Barbara Cox. There's so many Panther women who are still out here. Sally Dixon, we mentioned her earlier, is an amazing Panther uh, artist. You can look up her art as well. So they're almost all of the names that we mentioned um, are, are with us, right? And I think um, at a time where maybe we're more heightened and aware of the fleeting nature of life, um, we can look to these folks as our treasured sources, right? They are our primary sources. They are our gold. They are with us. We can ask them, you know, I, I get so many questions on History Day. Students are writing to me, you know, or edged on by their teacher to ask, you know, historians things. And, you know, I think it's nice sometimes to reach out to those folks who can tell how it was. Um, of course, they're busy and, you know, all of that. But, you know, sometimes there are venues in which you can hear their wisdom. So I always encourage people to, you know, just go and try to hear from the people who were directly involved and just to hear, sometimes when you hear a lot of stories and they're so different because Oakland was not Chicago, which was not New York, which was not Boston, which was not Detroit, which was not Milwaukee, right? So the Panthers were, you know, a, a nationwide, had nationwide expression, but they had local um, nuances as well. Right. And so being a, a woman in the party was very different based on where you were when you joined, who you were connected to, um, et cetera, et cetera. So just to get those complexities, I think, is also um, also important to to reach out to those uh, sources as well. And I think that's a nice lead in. I'm just address this because I think we're getting close to time. But someone asked that women actually feel equal in the movement. And, and, and it has a lot to do with, with what Dr. Spencer was saying. You know, that very, you know, that very person by person, chapter, branch, region, you know, you know, for example, in Detroit, in much of my work in Detroit, you would hear women, you know, who are former party members saying, look, you know, the experience I felt as a woman, I didn't experience all of the kind of sexism that folks may be experienced in LA or what have you. So it's not a blanket thing with all, you know, all women experience the same kind or the same degree. It really did vary um, by where you were located, you know, who was in the organization, the gender makeup, it's a whole lot. So it's very complicated. So I want to, I want to get away from the idea. A lot of people, when they think of the Panthers and think of women, they just think sexism. And that is really not the case at all. Well, uh, we are here at the end of our time. And so I really want to thank you, Mary and Robin. Uh, this has been so such a rich discussion. I've learned a lot that I'll be able to take into my classroom. And uh, yeah, I also just want to underline what you said about trying to reach out to the Panthers that are still with us. I've learned so much from them. We brought Mama C to, to our high school this year. And mm -hmm. And my, yeah, my students got to hear from her directly. It was an incredible experience. Um, you know, shout out to the Seattle chapter, the first chapter of the Black Panther Party outside of California. Um, and she was uh, met with with one of the founders here in Seattle. So that was that was wonderful. Um, but thanks everybody for this community space today reviving this history and bringing it to life. This has been just a delight to hear from you both today. Uh, we want everybody's feedback on this session and the content and the format. We've put a link in the chat box 
and before doing the evaluation, can everyone please uh, unmute yourself and just give your, your thanks and gratitude to, to Mary and Robin with us here today, these great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.